Welcome to Lecture 14 of Alenka Zupontrich, What is Sex? In this lecture, we will be focused on Part 3 of Chapter 4, Object Disoriented Ontology. The subsection for this chapter is titled, Death Drive 1, Freud. In this subsection, we are going to cover four main topics. First, the death drive as a theoretical construction site. Two, Freud's logic of the death drive as the aim of life. Three, the duality of the death drive and the life drive explicit in Freud to the notion of a monistic drive. And four, sexuality and the death drive operating between excess and lack. Starting with the death drive as a theoretical construction site, we can here see that from the introduction of the death drive in Sigmund Freud to its further exploration in the work of figures like Jacques Lacan, Jacques-Alain Miller, and Slavoj Žižek, the concept of the death drive has continued to evolve and change its meaning, lacking any single anchor or single orientation for philosophical exploration. Here to quote Alenka Zupontrich, Freud speculating on the possible origins of what he will call the death drive, quoting Freud, the attributes of life were at some time evoked in inanimate matter by the action of a force of whose nature we can form no conception. The tension which then arose in what had hitherto been inanimate substance endeavored to cancel itself out. In this way, the first instinct, drive, came into being. The instinct to return to the inanimate state. End quote. This instinct or drive to regain the supposed original homeostatic, tensionless state is what he will call the death drive. And here is Zizek on the death drive, quoting Zizek. Death drive means precisely that the most radical tendency of a living organism is to maintain a state of tension, to avoid final relaxation, in obtaining a state of full homeostasis. Death drive, as beyond the pleasure principle, is the very insistence of an organism on endlessly repeating the state of tension." End quote. What Alenka Zupancic is trying to capture in this quote, referencing both Freud's original understanding of the death drive to Zizek's exploration of the death drive, is to capture the paradox in the very conceptualization of death drive. Whereas Freud seems to point towards death drive as a desire for a tensionless state, inanimate matter, death, referencing a theory of the origin of life itself and the way life cancels itself out for an inanimate state. To Zizek's conception of the death drive, which paradoxically seems to capture the opposite notion, the death drive is a desire to maintain a state of tension, to endlessly repeat the same thing. How can both of these notions find a connection. Again, referencing the paradox explicit in the Freudian and the Zizekian notion of death drive. On the one hand, Freud, signaling death drive as the desire for a primordial, original, tensionless state, to the Zizekian death drive as a persistent, repetitive state of tension. What is the logical connection between the two? And how can Zizek justify a conceptual exploration of death drive based on this persistent, repetitive maintenance and deepening of tension? To understand how this jump took place, first, we have to understand that Freud's understanding of death drive was first and foremost a deconstruction of the vitalist notions of life as founded on grounding substance like, for example, in the philosophy of Henry Bergson and the Alain Vital. For Freud, there is no life substance. There is no grounding for life in itself. Rather, life is grounded in death, in its own cancellation, in its own annihilation. Lacan, in his Return to Freud, takes this as a clue that death drive is the very seat of the sexual energies, Death drive is the very seat of the life drive. 
In this way, Lacan points to the idea that we are not dealing with a dualistic split between life drive and death drive, but rather a primacy to the death drive, a type of impossibility of the one in the reality or the real of death. Here to quote Alenka Zupancic. Consider this long and most intriguing passage from Beyond the Pleasure Principle. If we are to take it as a truth that knows no exception that everything living dies for internal reasons, becomes inorganic once again, then we shall be compelled to say that the aim of all life is death, and looking backwards that inanimate things existed before living ones. The attributes of life were at some time evoked in inanimate matter by the action of a force of whose nature we can form no conception. The tension which then arose in what had hitherto been inanimate substance endeavored to cancel itself out. In this way the first instinct came into being, the instinct to return to the inanimate state. It was still an easy matter at that time for a living substance to die. The course of its life was probably only a brief one, whose direction was determined by the chemical structure of the young life. For a long time, perhaps, living substance was thus being constantly created afresh and easily dying, till decisive external influences altered in such a way as to oblige the still surviving substance to diverge ever more widely from its original course of life and to make ever more complicated detours before reaching its aim of death. These circuitous paths to death, faithfully kept to by the conservative instincts, would thus present us today with the picture of the phenomena of life." End quote. Here to summarize Freud's ideas on death drive. Life dies for internal, not external reasons. Once we get rid of external factors, we face a self-mediated death. Life attempts to reduce or eliminate the tension produced by its own emergence, i.e. life is suffering and the wish to never be born. And external complications make it harder and harder for life to die as evolution unfolds. Life takes detours to death, i.e. the conserved instinct. Here repeating these three axioms of the Freudian death drive or the logic of the death drive includes the principle that everything living dies, that death is caused internally, and that death is the fundamental aim. Here we get the dualism of the conservative instincts and the progressive instincts, of the instincts of the death drive linked to the conservative instincts, and the instincts of the life drive linked to the progressive instincts. Here in Freud, the dualism favors death as primary, and progressive instincts as secondary, or the life instincts as secondary. The reason why the conservative instincts are primary is because they are paving the pathway of death. And the reason the progressive instincts are secondary is because they have no life substance of their own. They are merely responses to the complications of the external environment, which then have to become sublated by conservative instinct to the pathway of death. In that sense, conservative instincts represent the quote-unquote tiredness of life, the fatigue of life. They have to do with death because death is still far away. One does not engage in conservative instinct because it's fun to do. It's rather not something that one wants to do, but rather something one has to do to mediate one's own death. Whereas progressive instincts, which give the appearance of a joy for life, which give the appearance of an elan vital for life, are actually ways constantly searching to ward off external death, ways of constantly introducing novelty to avoid the possibility, the external risk of an outside intrusion onto a process that needs to be self-mediated. Here to represent this in another quote from Freud. Life is a circuitous route to death, and conservative instincts are the pavement of this route. They are one with it, indistinguishable from it. 
Here in this representation, you see that life's goal or aim is death, but that due to external disturbances, life has to innovate. Life has to change. Life has to alter its pathway. Then the conservative instinct will sublimate this novelty, will sublate this novelty, and can literally be seen as the temporality of death. To requote Freud, the conservative instincts are the pavement of this route. They are one with it, indistinguishable from it. Here to quote Alenka Zupancic again. Freud is more than explicit on this point. Seen in this light, the theoretical importance of the instincts of self-preservation, of self-assertion, and of mastery greatly diminishes. They are component instincts whose function is to assure that the organism shall follow its own path to death, and to ward off any possible ways of returning to inorganic existence other than those which are imminent in the organism itself. According to this perspective, instincts of self-preservation do not, even temporarily, change life's fundamental goal, death. They simply introduce a temporality into it, and the mode of this temporality is essentially repetition. Conservative instincts repeat acquired established paths of life, unless they are forced, for external reasons, to change them, in which case they then tend to repeat those modified paths. And in this is what we wrongly perceive as instincts impelling toward change, development, and the production of new forms. Nothing is impelling this kind of change. There is no drive in it, end quote. So here to summarize this quote, conservation of habits is the very temporality of death, the repetition of the same, the first order of repetition is the conservative instincts. Then on another level, the new in itself has no internal motivation, no internal drive, only the necessity to avoid external death. Again, coming back to the aim of life as a internally mediated, a self-mediated process. Here we ask ourselves the question, what is life? Again, counter to the vitalists, life in the psychoanalytic, at least the Freudian psychoanalytic tradition, has no ground or source of its own. It has no self-mediated positivity. There's no Elan Vital, no life substance. Life is something rather that happens to inanimate matter due to an inherent contradiction of inanimate matter. Another way of saying this is that life happens to inanimate matter due to the increasing complexity of inanimate matter. Three, life, it becomes structured by perversions, strange pleasures, and ticks of the inanimate. And these perversions, strange pleasures, and ticks of the inanimate are the desire for death the desire to return to the old way of being, the desire to merge with the inanimate, the desire to self-mediate one's own death. Now we can think about Freud's famous The Pleasure Principle in the context of the death drive related to the process of the emergence of life as a far-from-equilibrium system. According to Freud, the death drive is the striving for a homeostatic equilibrium, and thus the pleasure principle in some sense is aligned with the death drive, since pleasure equals a release of tension. In other words, as life emerges, an unpleasurable tension builds up in the life world. The inanimate matter, which becomes living matter, becomes far from equilibrium, and far from equilibrium systems are structured by tension. This tension is perceived by the living organism itself as unpleasurable. So the pleasure principle here is a counter motion to this unpleasure. The pleasure principle equals a release of tension, a relaxation from life. Ultimately, the idea here 
is that the pleasure principle is striving for a total end of tension, something we might call the nirvana principle, or death itself, total relaxation. You can see here why Lacan reasoned that the pleasure principle and the death drive were one thing, that the life force found its truth in the death force, that the appearance of dualism was actually masking a deeper type of negative monism. Quoting Alenka Zupancic, Freud reaffirms his conviction concerning the primary character of what he named the pleasure principle. In the theory of psychoanalysis, we have no hesitation in assuming that the course taken by mental events is automatically regulated by the pleasure principle. We believe that is to say that the course of those events is invariably set in motion by an unpleasurable tension, and that it takes a direction such that its final outcome coincides with a lowering of that tension, that is, with an avoidance of unpleasure or a production of pleasure. We have decided to relate pleasure and unpleasure to the quantity of excitation that is present in the mind, but is not any way bound, and to relate them in such a manner that unpleasure corresponds to an increase in the quantity of excitation and pleasure to a diminution. It is clear from this passage that the pleasure principle for Freud does not refer to any kind of hedonistic searching and striving for pleasure, actively looking for gratification and satisfaction, but basically to seeking relief from tension and excitation, to the lowering of tension in an attempt to reach a homeostatic state. End quote. Here, the main points that I think are worth repeating is that the mind, mental thoughts, are governed by the pleasure principle. Thoughts emerge in tension of life with the world. Another point that's important to consider is that of unbound excitation. Unbound excitation emerges in unpleasure, whereas bound excitation equals diminished pleasure. Here, the ultimate problem is a binding problem. This could be formulated in the Zizekian axiom, there is no big other. A final point to consider is related to the pleasure principle itself. The pleasure principle is seeking relief from tension and excitation. The lowering of a t tension over a searching for more pleasure. Here, think about any basic repetitive action like, perhaps classically, smoking a cigarette. Now, Zupancic goes further, linking not only the pleasure principle to the death drive, but the reality principle to the life drive. Here, the pleasure principle paradoxically gets aligned with death, whereas the reality principle gets linked to the goal of the prolongation or the postponement of death due to the complications of the external environment. The pleasure principle works in accordance with the desire for a homeostatic state as a consequence death, return of the inanimate, whereas the reality principle forces the postponement of pleasure, in other words, the real as what does not work or what thwarts your desire. This is the origin of the circuitous prolongation, the fact that there is no beyond or no other to the pleasure principle, just its thwarting its negativity. It is this thwarting this negativity which gains the Lacanian distinction of the monistic drive. Now that Alenka Zupancic has attempted to convince us in some sense that both the pleasure and the reality principle point towards the death drive in a Lacanian sense, a monistic force, a monistic negativity, that of Thanatos, coupled by an internal self-mediated death and life's prolongation due to the external complications of the environment. She then asks us to consider, again, the sexual drives, the quote-unquote true life instincts, with the question, does sex break out of the circle of life's attempt to return to death? Is eros more or less than life? Here she points to the idea that when we're thinking about eros in itself, 
there's a way in which it thrives on excitement and tension. The way in which Eros allows for a type of endless continuation of life, of a reproduction that embraces altiarity, difference, otherness, a type of anti-fatigue, a type of phenomena with an independent logic, a lawless logic of perpetual motion. In the traditional split between Eros as life and Thanatos as death, Eros is here on the side of the species being, without any firm ground. Only its potential for immortality, the endless striving. Whereas Thanatos is on the side of the individual organism, which is in some sense already dead, doomed to death, as hopefully we have covered in sufficient depth. To complicate this dualism, Zupanchit suggests that the life instincts cannot subsume sexuality, that no principle or law explains sexuality, that sex is not necessarily a dualism or a substance, but rather involves a split, a repetition, a surplus satisfaction, and a constant pressure. In this way, we start to see that Alenka Zupancic is pointing towards the idea that what is involved in the potential immortality of our species being involves the opposite of homeostasis or relaxation, namely a mediation of this pressure. And this brings us to one of the most important divisions in all of psychoanalysis, that of the division between Freud and Jung on a theory of sexuality. For Freud, Sexuality is partial and desubstantialized, meaning it cannot be whole, totalized as complete. And it is a non-substantial grounding, as we've covered. It has no elan vital, no base. Whereas for Jung, sexuality is holistic and substantial, meaning that it is a neutral totality, which is, of course, and famously, in itself non-sexual that contains all of the drives and has a substantial ground that one can identify with as a type of big other. Here to quote Alenka Zupancic. This is precisely what was at stake in Freud's split with Jung, this desexualization of the libido in terms of a neutral primary substance, subsequently divided between different drives which are all part of this great whole called the libido and basically constituting two complementary principles. Freud's fundamental move, on the other hand, was to desubstantialize sexuality. The sexual is not a principle to be properly described and circumscribed. It is the very impossibility of its own circumscription or delimitation. It can neither be completely separated from biological organic needs and functions. Since it originates within their realm, it starts off by inhabiting them, nor can it be simply reduced to them. The sexual is not a separate principle or domain of human life. And this is why it can inhabit all the domains of human life. Ultimately, it is nothing but the inherent contradiction of life, which in turn loses its self-evident character." End quote. In other words, the sexual is the omnipresent impossibility in Freud that can neither be escaped nor avoided, as has been noted by philosophers like Slavoj Žižek. Rather, sexuality has to simply be lived with in contradiction, which is again the central thesis of this book, What is Sex? Thus, Alenka Zupancic points to the idea that Freud's dualism between the life drives and the death drives can be mediated towards the logic of a monistic singularity, of constant tension rather than a homeostatic equilibrium. That of a constant tension or antagonism, contradiction, on the level of the species being, and not just the psychoanalysis of the individual's inevitable death. We see here how Freud's own theory, Alenka Zupancic is suggesting, is limited by the very theoretical grounding of psychoanalysis. When we extend the theory to species being, the 
death of the individual is replaced by the immortality of the species being. In Lacanian analysis, this monistic singularity of tension finds expression in the lawless partial object, nominated as the object petit a, which is an object holding both the subject's love and also the subject's hate. We reach another split. Quote, Reaffirming his central thesis about this sexual nature of the libido as such, Freud in his last part of his essay thus works with the hypothesis that there are only sexual drives, almost imperceptibly. The perspective has thus again shifted dramatically. From the monism of the death drive, qua pleasure principle, we move to the dualism of eros and thanatos, that is, of sexual drives and death drives, and from there to the monism of sexual drives. In what sense can we say that this now implies a monism not of substance, but of a split or an obstacle that prevents substance from being one? First of all, sexual drives are no longer simply viewed as life drives, because they repeat or reproduce the very split between life and death. With sexual drives, death is inherent to life, conditioning its perpetuation, and in brief, this negativity, this minus, inherent to life, becomes the very site of psychic life, insofar as the latter is coextensive with the unconscious." End quote. To summarize some of the most important points, Zupanchic here is forwarding the idea of monism of split or obstacle, preventing the life from being one, the death inherent to sexuality. Another point, Sex drives are not life drives, but the split between life and death, and the sight of the psyche itself. Thus, we reach the truth of the psyche in both death and the split between life and death itself, which Zupanchich is saying is sexuality as such. The consequence is that sexuation involves death. To be a sexual being is to also be a being of death. To be a sexual being, one must internalize loss. One must internalize the fact that death is an inevitability. The final goal of life to the inherent negativity and the internal presupposition of life. In other words, death is something to be used. Death is something to be worked with actively by the sexual being. The truth of one's psyche is at this very locus, at this very split. Now to the Lacanian death drive. Zupanchich gives a summary of five important points to consider when thinking about Lacan's own hypothesis of the death drive. First, following Freud, instincts repeat acquired established life paths, the conservative pathway which is indistinguishable from death. Two, new or different repetitions emerge within this repetition as a surplus. In other words, on the conservative life path, the very repetition of this path involves a second split, a redoubled repetition. This surplus causes an internal tension and pressure which repeats itself, internal to the conservative life path. This internal pressure and tension is again the eros and the split which is necessary for the increase of tension, not the reduction of tension. New repetition represents an offshoot of an additional drive, uh, an additional drive built on the conservative drive. And finally, the objective representation of negativity is, as linked to this drive, inherent to the signifying order. The overall point here is that in the Lacanian universe, there is no objective truth as a substantial other, here thinking about the nature of God or nature itself, but rather an objective truth as negativity, which is both ahistorical, always present within the symbolic order, and historical, taking on a unique expression within each particular symbolic order. And this takes us back to 
psychoanalysis in the Lacanian variety. For Lacan, the objective negativity of each subject manifests in a drive and its partial object, on the level of the oral, the anal, the genital, the gaze, the voice, and also smell. Each of these partial objects represents or figures a surplus satisfaction, operating in the very gap or loss of the thing. In other words, if in the Lacanian universe there is a monistic negativity, a objective representation of death, the partial object of the subject, the surplus satisfaction that emerges on top of the conservative instinct, is the singular representation of death for that subject. Here a good example of how these partial drives emerge from, but at the same time become decoupled from, organic needs, can be found in the difference between eating and gluttony, or reproduction and masturbation. Gluttony and masturbation serve no, no organic need, but operate purely for the enjoyment of the drive. The idea of the death drive as a repetition within repetition is that it raises tension and this disequilibrium, that it works against life or organic needs, or at least has no care or concern for life and organic needs, that it reproduces itself for itself as drive, that it operates as a negative circulation in the location of primal repression, in other words, the missing signifier or missing phallus, and that it is the very positive embodiment of negativity. Here with the classical Freudian model of the psyche, structured as it is by superego, ego, and id, the superego operates on the register of the positive order of being, reifying social appearances, where we do get the formation of a big other in the form of God or nature. The ego, which operates on the basic survival of the organism, searching as it is for balance and harmony with the appearances, opting for survival and identifying, perhaps, with the conservative instincts. And the id, as the pure negativity of the drive itself, a redoubled repetition in the lack itself. The truth of the psyche here flips from its search for an identity in the superego, qua positive order of being, to the truth of the missing phallus and the embodiment of this negativity. Here let us return to Freud's own definition of death drive. Quote, Component instincts, whose function is to assure that the organism shall follow its own path to death, and to ward off any possible ways of returning to inorganic existence other than those which are imminent to the organism itself. End quote. Zupanchich here proposes a modification. Death drive, in our meaning of the term, could be described precisely as establishing and driving the ways of returning to inorganic existence other than those which are imminent to the organism itself, yet it cannot be described in terms of destructive tendencies that want us to return to the inanimate, but precisely as constituting alternative path to death from those imminent in the organism itself. We could say, the death drive is what makes it possible for us to die differently, and perhaps in the end this is what matters, and what breaks out from the fatigue of life, not the capacity to live forever, but the capacity to die differently. We could even paraphrase the famous Beckettian line and formulate the motto of the death drive as follows. Die again, die better. The modification here includes within it the crucial idea that the death drive is not an attempt to return to a homeostatic balance or a destructive annihilation, but rather that the death drive is what helps us to explore different pathways to death other than purely natural pathways. The death drive, or coming to the truth of the psyche and the negativity of the id, is helping us to die differently. Think of the greatest subjects in various fields from history. It is precisely those subjects we remember because they died differently than the large majority of subjectivity. This notion is incredibly important and should be used to counter the notion that the human subject wants to literally live forever in some techno-scientific, transhumanist sense. The techno-scientific transhumanist should instead be read in terms of the historicity of their death drive, as unconsciously attempting to die differently, for example, cryogenic freezing. <laughs>
The phrase die again die better thus becomes Zupanjic's motto for the death drive. The death drive is the embodiment of a negativity that does not call for the destruction of the organism or the subject, but helps the organism or the subject to die in a different way. And this is again to revisit the overview of what we've covered for this subsection of Chapter 4, Object Disoriented Ontology. First, we covered the idea that death drive is a theoretical construction site with no clear anchor or orientation. Indeed, embodied in a contradiction that is obvious if we read the basic primary texts of someone like Sigmund Freud and Slavoj Žižek. Second, Freud's logic of the death drive as the aim of life. We covered the fact that the conservative instincts and the progressive instincts are both in service of death drive. Third, we covered the duality of drives in Eros and Thanatos to an understanding of the monistic drive as becomes more evident in Lacanian theory, as the type of objective negativity. And finally, we covered the nature of sexuality and the death drive, specifically trying to unpack the difference between the Freudian sexuality and Jungian sexuality, and the way it operates on excess and lack in Lacan. And that concludes Lecture 14 of Alenka Zupancic, What is Sex? Chapter 4, Object Disoriented Ontology, under the subsection, Death Drive 1, Freud. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your attention. And if you want to help this work, the best way to support is to become a member on Patreon.